Welcome everyone to the Scientific Approach to Healthy Living 2017 edition. I'm a big believer in quotes and I love this one, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. In the next few minutes I want to share with you the power of food and what is the evidence, not opinion, but the evidence around what food can do for us. So with that, let's go ahead and get started and look at the data around the power of food and things you should eat more of and what you should eat less of. Starting with the first study, in 2017 there was a really nice study that showed that in 2012 nearly half of the deaths that occurred were due to either eating too much of certain foods or too little of other foods and these deaths were due to heart disease, diabetes or stroke. The reason it's such a big deal is because half of those deaths were simply due to what we put in our mouths and that's something that we have the ability to change. So with that, let's start off our journey with looking at foods and nutrients. The first one is whole grains. What is the evidence around whole grains? Well, if you start to look at all cause, cardiovascular, cancer mortality, the data shows that if you give me one serving of whole grains per day, you can actually reduce your all cause by 5%, cardiovascular mortality by 9%. And if you can give me three servings or 90 grams per day of whole grains, you can reduce your total cancer mortality by 15%. That is an amazing change simply by one to three servings per day. Weight loss is really interesting because what we have found is that if you substitute whole grains for refined grains, you can actually find that your resting metabolic rate can go up by as much as 40 some calories per day. Stool weight increases by 76 grams per day which means that the stool energy also increases. What's the bottom line there? That if you do nothing differently, you're actually burning an additional 92 calories per day. Fascinating that a little change in your diet to whole grains can make. Fruits and vegetables. Let's to look at some really large data when it comes to blood pressure and diabetes. If you eat fresh fruits daily versus rarely or never, you'll find that the blood pressure goes down by four points. Blood sugar actually goes down when you have whole fruits and vegetables. Now this is not talking about fruit juices, this is referring to the whole fruit. So for everybody who juices or buys juices, it's not a habit that's going to allow you to be healthy. And interestingly enough, increasing your daily intake of fruits and vegetables actually lowers the risk of new occurrence of diabetes. How about mortality with fruits and vegetables? For every single additional serving, maximum of five, of fruits and vegetables per day, you got an all-cause mortality drop of 5%, cardiovascular drop of 4%. When it comes to cancer, another really large study that came out this year with over 2 million people, what's the data? Cancer mortality goes down by 4% if you just eat 2.5 servings per day and goes down by 14% if you eat 7.5 servings. You can easily get 7.5 servings just by adding fruits and vegetables to every single one of your plate. If you're eating anything. Just remember, fill up half your plate with greens. What are the best types of vegetables when it comes to cancer mortality? Those are your greens and yellow vegetables, especially your cruciferous vegetables, things like kale, cabbage. How about protein? We have over 800 studies that actually show that red and processed meat are bad for you. In fact, if you get an additional serving of red meat per day, your total mortality, cancer mortality, cardiovascular mortality, all go up. Now red meat is beef, pork and lamb and processed meat is anything whether it's bacon, sausage, cured meats, all are considered processed meats. When we start to change the discussion and looking at more plant-based proteins what we find is that if you increase the ratio of how much plant-based proteins which are things like tofu, beans, nuts, legumes, lentils, you find that if you don't have kidney disease, you actually have a 12% reduction in mortality. And if you do have kidney disease, you have a 23% reduction in mortality. Plant versus animal protein. It's important to understand that what we eat makes a significant impact on the environment and world around us. So it's just as important to make sure that we look at what is the impact of food. Well, if you get a kilogram of protein from beans, it actually requires 18 times less land than beef, 10 times less water, 9 times less fuel, 12 times less fertilizer, and 10 times less pesticide than a kilogram of beef does. So every single time you go to the grocery store and you make a purchase, it matters. How about fish and heart disease? 
When we start to look at the data, what we find is that if you're consuming fish more than four times per week, you got a 21% reduction in acute coronary syndrome. 100 grams of fish per week is associated with 5% reduction. So even as little as just one serving of fish per week can make a difference. When we look at cancer mortality in the EPIC trial, what we find is there isn't a significant relationship between fish and cancer. And data also talks about what is the relationship between the mercury and the World Health Organization's cancer research arm has published data on this, that the benefits of fish still outweigh the potential harm that may be due to things like mercury. How about dairy? When we start to look at dairy and cardiovascular disease and stroke, what we find is if you replace dairy with 5% calories from polyunsaturated fatty acids, things like a handful of nuts, you can actually lower your risk of heart disease by 24%, lower your risk of stroke by 25%. And when it comes to Parkinson's disease, this was a really interesting study published in Neurology this year, which was a meta-analysis of the previous four studies. It, of course, looked at the data from the health professionals and nurses' health study, and what did they find? Greater than three servings per day of low-fat dairy versus less than one, you had a 39% increased risk for Parkinson's disease. Now, the absolute risk was 1%, but this has to be taken into account for a disease whose occurrence, total occurrence, is actually low. So even 1% is something to be thoughtful of. How about dairy and cancer mortality? Well, when we look at total dairy intake, we find it's not necessarily associated with all cause, meaning the risk of dying from any type of cancer, but with whole milk and in another a large meta-analysis, it was low-fat milk, but what we find is there's a 43% increase in prostate cancer mortality. Let's get into fats a little bit. When we look at the saturated fat data, there's the 2015 Cochrane Database Analysis, there's also the 2017 SACS um, circulation, the Presidential Advisory from the American Heart Association, but the Cochrane Randomized Control Studies, and the word randomized is important because most studies in nutrition are population-based. So what's the data? The data is if you reduce your saturated fat intake, you actually lower your cardiovascular events by 17%. And if you replace saturated fats once again with polyunsaturated fats, things like a handful of nuts, your cardiovascular events actually go down. And there was no effect if you replace it with higher protein or higher carbohydrates. The Bogalusa Children's Heart Study was important to understand because when you give children higher amounts of animal fats early on, you find that they tend to gain weight early on and sometimes it becomes incredibly hard for those habits and that weight to come off later on in life. So really, adopting a healthy diet starts very, very early in life and those patterns actually stay with you a long time. When we talk about monounsaturated fatty acids, this was a really interesting meta-analysis because what they showed was higher monounsaturated fatty acid intake was associated with an 11% reduction in all cause, 12% reduction in cardiovascular, and 17% in reduction in stroke. But the thing that was really fascinating was that it was only in the plant-based sources and not in the animal-based sources of monounsaturated fatty acids. So essentially, plant-based sources, olive oil being one of them, was associated with the beneficial effect of monounsaturated fatty acids. When we look at nuts, we find that the highest consumption of nuts versus lowest consumption in meta-analysis with almost half a million people was all-cause mortality goes down 19%. Cardiovascular mortality goes down 27%. How about nuts and cancer? What we find is in highest versus lowest nut consumption and cancer risk, colorectal cancer goes down by 24%, endometrial cancer goes down by 42%, pancreatic cancer 32%, and overall cancer death with highest nut consumption goes down by 14%. Let's take a look at oils because this is a really controversial area and one that has a lot of marketing behind it. So coconut oil gets talked about a lot and it's thought to have a lot of powers, but nothing in the history of coconut oil has changed. It's still 82% saturated fat. 67% of it is lauric, myristic, and palmitic acids, all of which actually increase your risk of atherosclerosis. Now, stearic acid is not known to cause atherosclerosis, and there's 3% of that. Monounsaturated fats like oleic acid, 
2% polyunsaturated fats like linoleic acid. And the most important, where there's all this fascinating data coming out on medium chain triglycerides for things like cognition and epilepsy, and even when you talk about other things like migraines, for example, there's data around MCTs, but coconut oil is not a very rich source of MCTs. So what's the data? When we start to look at the data, we find that as you increase coconut oil, LDL goes higher than if you're looking at other things, especially things like unsaturated plant oils. That doesn't mean you should go from one oil to the other. Oils generally really ought to not be a part of your diet and ought to be limited. Now, coconut flesh, which means actual coconuts, do not lead to adverse cardiovascular outcomes. So this is really important because it's a difference of coconut oil versus coconuts. And that's important to understand. When we look at certain indigenous populations like the Puka Pukans and the Tokelauans who have very low rates of heart disease, it's interesting to see that their diets are incredibly low in sugar, high in fiber. They have whole coconuts, breadfruit, and fish, but they don't use a lot of coconut oil. In the Kitawan studies from the Melanesian island, what we find is their fat intake is only 21% versus the typical American fat intake is way upwards of 30%. So they're already having a low fat diet and their diet is whole coconuts, tubers, fish, and fruit. How about fiber? Well, we start to take a look at all-cause mortality and we find that if you can just give me 10 grams increase in dietary fiber, you'll get an 11% reduction in all-cause mortality. And when we look at cancer, you see that higher intakes of fiber actually have 17% reduction in colorectal cancer, 49% reduction in liver cancer, and breast cancer goes down by a little bit, 5%, which other studies show there isn't a difference. But bottom line is, nice differences in colorectal liver and breast, but it's not the cure-all. So there's no association with stomach, biliary, endometrium, prostate, kidney, or bladder. Salt. We started this discussion talking about cardiometabolic deaths, right? Heart disease, stroke, diabetes. And we said there were 10 items that accounted for almost half of the deaths due to these three conditions that occurred in 2012. Well, the number one cause was actually high salt intake. So if your sodium intake is greater than two grams, that was linked to 66,000 deaths from heart disease, stroke, and type two diabetes. 66,000 that could have been prevented simply by having lower salt. How do you do that? Get rid of junk food, get rid of processed foods, eat more whole foods. Sugar is really interesting because as much as people try to deny the impact of sugar, sugar is linked to cardiovascular mortality. If you're consuming more than 10% of your calories from added sugars, what happens? 30% increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. And if you're getting more than 25% from added sugars, your mortality goes up by a whopping 175%. Now, sugar is in everything, and artificial sweeteners, whether it's the green, blue, purple, doesn't matter. Any artificial sweetener, stevia included, they are generally considered not to be healthy for you. For one, if you're trying to get over your sugar cravings, doing any kind of artificial sweetener that's already sweeter than sugar is never going to allow you to get over those cravings. In fact, if you give up sugar just for two weeks, your taste buds will automatically change and regular fruits will actually taste sweeter. The reason we find regular fruits with fiber and all the, the fantastic polyphenols not to taste sweet is because our sugar in our diet is so high that we need such a large amount just to have the same taste effect. So that's where even artificial sweeteners matter. And artificial sweeteners are linked to increased weight gain. And there's some data emerging that some of them may actually be linked to possible increases in things like dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. Now, let's talk about a couple of different healthy eating patterns, starting with one that's very popular, which is Mediterranean. The Mediterranean pattern is essentially a whole foods, plant-based diet at its core, where there's lots of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. And then they use, generally speaking, more olive oil instead of things like butter, Red meat is only a couple of times a month. They do eat fish and poultry, but it's in low to moderate amounts. And also they drink wine, especially red wine in low to moderate amounts. And what's the data? When we look at the PREDIMED trial, 
and it was comparing uh, the randomized arm of Mediterranean diet versus low fat. Now keep in mind, the criticism of the study is the low fat arm wasn't really low fat. It was even higher than 30%. But more importantly, what's interesting about the Mediterranean uh, diet and the Predimet trial was that there was a 30% reduction in primary events in the Mediterranean diet arm plus extra virgin olive oil. And there was a 28% reduction in the Mediterranean diet arm and nuts. Now that's not different from nuts versus olive oil. In other words, it's not the olive oil. You don't have to have olive oil. Just a little bit of nuts in your diet can make a big difference. People will argue that nuts are really high in fat, they'll cause you weight gain, but any item you take to the extreme will have an impact. Life is all about balance and there's never been a secret that will go ahead and fix things. And fascinating was that there was a 40% reduction in type 2 diabetes incidence. Another study was interesting. This was a meta-analysis with a million and a half people. And what did they find? As you get closer to a Mediterranean lifestyle pattern, not just one single ingredient, olive oil or nuts or anything like that, but overall, lots of whole foods, olive oil, you know, nuts, uh, low to moderate amounts of wine, etc. What happened? 9% reduction in all-cause mortality risk, 9% reduction in cardiovascular mortality, 6% reduction in cancer, and even Parkinson's and Alzheimer's goes down by 13%. Let's talk about another healthy eating pattern, whole foods, plant-based diet. And in that, what is the data? It's fascinating that if you can become completely vegan, the diabetes incidence goes down by 62%. Cancer mortality goes down, all-cause mortality goes down, and even if you can't, but you are moving toward that direction, whether you're lacto-ovo, pesco, or semi-vegetarian, which is closer to what a Mediterranean diet is, all of those things you will find beautiful improvements in the diabetes incidence, beautiful improvements in things like cancer mortality and even all-cause mortality. And then lastly, it's important to understand the impact of what you eat on the environment. We know that 70% of all water pollution in rivers and lakes comes from animal farms. Just by changing our dietary patterns, we can actually help the environment. 20% of overall U.S. methane generation is from cattle. Even greenhouse gas emissions, when we think about it, animal products, red meat specifically, creates 10 to 40 times higher emissions than plants do vegetarian diets, you have a 63% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And vegan diets, you have a 70% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So if all of us started to shift away from meats, it would have a tremendous impact on the world that we live in. So what's the bottom line here? Do you have to adopt one main thing? No. The bottom line after doing research and reviewing thousands of studies is Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. This is by Michael Pollan, who I am a big, big fan of, and I love his work. But that's literally it. That's the bottom line. And if you want more of a scientific answer, eat more of whole grains, fruits and vegetables, seafood, legumes and nuts, and eat less of salt, refined grains, red and processed meat, sugar-sweetened foods and beverages. That's literally it. And I know that's a lot of information to process, and you don't have to think of, I have to give up everything right away. You have to adopt a pattern that you can stick to for the rest of your life. Quick fixes, quick diets, they just don't work. That's why self-principle is sleep more, exercise more, love more, meditate more, show gratitude, be in the moment, practice mindfulness, and for food, eat mostly plants doesn't mean you have to go 100%. Thank you so much for checking this out. Don't forget to check out selfprinciple.org and please share, like, and subscribe on social media. See you next time.